Right, it's 7.30, let's get started. I am Vivian New, your host tonight. And the talk that I hope you are all here to see is Locally Native Plants for Bay Area Gardens, which is by Arvind, who has been um, chatting with us as we get started. Um, but before we get really get started, I wanted to acknowledge that the work done by the Santa Clara Valley chapter of CNPS lies in the homeland of the Muwekma Ohlone, the Amamutsun Tribal Band, the Tamian Nation, and the Ramayatush Ohlone, who still live and thrive in this area today. We hope to learn from them and support their work to restore traditional practices and heal from historical trauma. And as Arvind has already requested, but for those of you who might have come in after he did so, if this happens to be your first talk with us, we would love to know how you found out about us and where you are. So if you don't mind, please share that in the chat. And these talks are the work of a team, It's not just me and Arvind. We also have Madeline Morrow, who is here to be our QA moderator on Zoom. And we have Barbara Hunt, who is our QA moderator on YouTube. So we have, this talk is being live streamed both on Zoom and on YouTube. So if you are on YouTube, don't worry, anything that you type into the chat will get transferred over here to Zoom so that we will be able to answer anything that comes up. If you are not familiar with CNPS, uh, we are a nonprofit environmental organization. We were formed in 1965. We have over 10,000 members in 35 chapters that are spread all over California and actually beyond not just our state, but also our country because we have a chapter in Baja, California. Our chapter, the Santa Clara Valley chapter, covers both Santa Clara uh, County and the Southern San Mateo as well. And our mission is to save California's native plants and habitats. And we do that through science, education, conservation, and gardening. If you are not currently a member of CNPS, we would love to have you join us. Um, once you join, besides supporting wonderful programs like this one, you will also receive two great journals, Artemisia and Flora. So Artemisia is our scientific journal and Flora has a lot of general interest articles. They are both beautiful and interesting. You'll also get our chapter newsletter, The Blazing Star, which tells you about the activities that our chapter is doing, as well as has really some really interesting informational articles as well. And you also get discounts at local participating nurseries. So, if you are not currently a member, please do consider joining. Um, I will tell you a secret in a little bit. Well, it's not really a secret, but uh, there, there's some another thing you can do if you're interested in joining. So hang on. Um, I am making a personal plug for Gall Week, which is this week right now. Um, and you can find out more about it at that URL, which is biobitblitz.club event-info Gall Week 2022. It's a really new thing that was started locally. Um, if you don't know about Gaul, though, um, join us in two weeks because we are going to have a talk about them, um, which is called Plant Galls for the Curious Naturalist by Mirav Vonchak and Michael Hawk. Um, for those of you who are here today, you probably care a lot about plant and, and plant, native plants and their habitats. And uh, one of the reasons you probably care about that is because of that very tight connection between pollinators and plants, well, there are actually other types of insects that have a very direct connection to specific native plants and they farm gall. So it's fascinating. The more you learn about them, um, I think the more interested you'll get. I know I am. Um, they can also help you with plant ID. So I urge you to learn more about galls and join us again in two weeks. But right now is gall week. So there's a bunch of interesting activities and those URLs up here um, can tell you more about them. But there's a lot going on with our chapter this month. So Arvind, our speaker tonight, it does a, has a, is in charge of a native plant garden at Millie Cunningham and there's habitat restoration work there every Saturday. So the next, uh, next one is actually this Saturday but there's also another one on the 17th and the 20th and that's early in the morning. So please think about joining. Um, we also have a field trip planning meeting coming up tomorrow. And so, oh, I put the wrong date. Um, it's actually September 8th. So tomorrow night at eight at 7 p.m., our field trip leader is actually here on the call. Oh, there, she even put it um, 
or sorry, you send it to me. But anyways, it's tomorrow night. You can find out the de the, the details on uh, meetup our, on our meetup group or on our website. Um, and then I just, as I just mentioned, uh, we have a talk about plant galls in two weeks that was just um, scheduled. So I wanted to highlight that, uh, that there is information about it on our website now, um, but I will be pushing out more information on Meetup. So it's not even on Meetup yet. Our photo group is meeting on September 23rd at 7 p.m. And we have two field trips coming up this month. So there is one on um, Saturday, September 24th at Edgewood on the Oaks of Edgewood. That one's gonna be a great one. And there's gonna be another one the day after on September 24th, a Sunday, which is the first day of fall bird and plant ID walk. And our speaker tonight is going to be one of the leaders of that trip. So he is a very, very busy man. Uh, anyways, if you wanna know more about any of these things, uh, just you can either go to our website, which is cnps-scv.org. And, or you can go on to our meetup group. And there's, if you have a QR code reader, you can actually just flash them up there and get directly to the right page. And there is something else going on right at the beginning of October. So our chapter turns 50 this year, or it has turned 50 already, actually. And we are throwing ourselves a birthday party on October 8th, which also happens to be our football plant sale. There's a lot going on that day, so I'm not gonna even try to describe everything. Um, you can go onto our website and find out more about it at 50th anniversary. Uh, and it should be a really fun day. And a, a, it's also the fall plant sale. So there'll, there'll be plants from both our nursery and grassroots ecology. As with previous years, and I better, I'm just gonna make sure everybody hears this. We are having only very limited number of plants for sale at the event itself, we are doing an online sale in advance with plant pickup the day of. So do not be disappointed the day of by showing up and thinking that you're going to buy plants. Uh, spend the week before, take your time, um, look online, buy your plants, and then you can just come by and, and enjoy the rest of the really fun activities we have planned for you that day. If you want to make sure that you are always on top of what's going on with our chapter, make sure that you are on our chapter's news mailing list. You get a weekly notification um, about what's going on. It's very easy to join. It's a Google group. Uh, you can go onto our website to get the details, or you can just send email to cnps-scv-news plus subscribe at googlegroups.com. And now a little bit of housekeeping. So please make sure your microphones are muted. If you have questions for Arvind at any point in time, please type them into the chat. We will be taking care of that for you. You please do not unmute yourself and ask the questions, but we will make sure we get all the questions that go into chat um, that will be read to Arvind. We do expect to finish by 9 p.m. And as I mentioned before, this is also being shown on YouTube and it will be made available for viewing immediately after the talk or actually even during. So now tonight's program is being given by Arvind Kumar, who leads, as you probably have noticed, the work days at Lake Cunningham every Saturday morning. He is also a past president of our chapter. He served on the state CNPS board. And he says he is an engineer by training, a lazy gardener by choice, which I totally do not believe Arvind. And he's just a wee bit obsessed with native plants. So Arvind, I am turning it over to you now. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Uh, just give me a little bit of time to share. Can you see my slide now? Looks good. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Arvind Kumar. I'm a software engineer by profession. And you should know that everything I know about native plants, I learned from CNPS. I went to talks. I went on walks. I went to classes. I went to symposiums, conferences. And this is what I've uh, sort of gleaned and gathered over the last 20 years. But uh, be, be aware that I'm not an expert on the subject. I'm merely sharing with you what I've learned. Today's talk is based on my experience growing native plants in my home garden. 
and at the two acre native plant garden at Lake Cunningham. And my interest in locally native plants is piqued by something I heard at a talk 20 years ago. A local landscape professional was speaking uh, at that talk and something she said stayed with me. She said she used plants from all over the state in her designs because Santa Clara Valley was once a grassland and what diversity can there be in a grassland? At the time I was new to native plants but that remark stayed with me. And as I learned more about California native plants, I realized that there is remarkable diversity of plants right here where we live. So this talk is all about the native plants that are local to our area that can be grown in home gardens with ease. So today we're gonna uh, talk about some terms and definitions of what's a native plant, what's a locally native plant. We're gonna talk briefly about how you can find out what plants are locally native to your area where you live. The main part of the presentation is about 70, 75 slides long. There's a lot of plants that I wanna share with you tonight. Um, and then I will conclude with some recommendation of books that must be in your library. So what's a native plant? Um, one definition that, that a lot of people um, use is any plant that occurs and grows naturally in a specific region or locality. And where this definition breaks down is that there are many introduced plants, plants from other parts of the world, that have been introduced to California that now have naturalized here and they grow naturally by themselves without any human input. Uh, examples are eucalyptus, vinca, and calla lily. These are not native to California, but you can find them in the wild areas of California. A second definition is a plant that naturally occurred in an area before disturbance by humans. And this definition gets close to it, except that it doesn't recognize that native Californians have been in the state for 10,000 or more years. And they were not passive observers of the landscape. They were active participants. They were managing the land through burning, through digging, through, through various forms of control. They were managing the landscape that Europeans saw when they first arrived here. So the generally accepted definition of a native plant today is a plant that was growing in California prior to the arrival of Europeans. What is a locally native plant? So remember that every plant is native to some particular region on earth, is local to some particular place on earth. A plant's native range may be very small, or it may be very large. And I'll give you two examples. The first is yarrow, common yarrow. It occurs in California, it occurs in Canada, it occurs in Iceland, it occurs in Northern Europe, and it's even found in the Himalaya in India. So that's yarrow for you, and it's native all over the Northern Hemisphere. By contrast, we have in Morgan Hill, a Cianothus called Coyote Cianothus, Cianothus fericiae, that occurs only in a very small area over some hillsides there. It's actually adjacent to the Anderson Dam that is being rebuilt. So, so when we talk about a plant's native range, keep in mind that range may be small or large. In a large state like California, Every plant does not occur in every corner of the state. And therefore it's useful to talk in terms of what is locally native, where you get to define what local is, but local implies a certain area. It could be a neighborhood, it could be a citywide, it could be countywide or statewide. So if you wanna find out what plants are native to your location, go to this wonderful website created by the California Native Plant Society. It's called calscape.org. And there's a 
which is there where you can type in your address or your zip code and it will search its database and come up with a list of plants that are local to that area. When I did the search, it told me that 370 plants are native to where I live. Some, some radius of, of where I live, out of which 19 trees, 55 shrubs, 109 perennials, 177 annuals, 27 grasses, and so on. But it also very nicely categorizes them into sun loving, shade loving, part shade loving, and so on and so forth. So this is a tremendously useful resource for you to narrow down um, your list of what plants might work where you live. So now the main part of tonight's talk, locally native plants for gardens. And I've organized this by size. We're gonna talk about large trees then smaller trees, large shrubs and vines, followed by smaller shrubs. We'll talk about some grasses, perennials, bulbs, and annuals. And remember, this is a very personal list of things that I've grown or seen people grow. Um, and it's not meant to be comprehensive. It's actually meant to be uh, something that piques your interest, that, that sparks your interest into uh, if you have an empty spot in your garden and you're looking for ideas on what to plant there, I hope that in tonight's talk, you'll, you'll come away with some ideas. So let's talk about some tree suggestions. I have four large trees to suggest. If you have the space, try big leaf maple. This tree is uh, deciduous. It has beautiful fall color. Uh, the leaves turn bright yellow. And in nature, it grows near freshwater creeks and streams. So if you're gonna put it in your garden, make sure that it has access to summer water. Um, it's winter deciduous. Um, its seeds are these winged samaras. When, when they're ripe, they fall away from the tree like helicopter blades and, and they hover away from, from the tree and land somewhere else. So that's big leaf maple for you. It's called big leaf maple because of all the maples, the leaves are uh, the largest. And I actually collected a leaf from uh, Penitentia Creek in Alum Rock Park that was fully two feet wide, two feet. Uh, it was growing in the shade. And usually things that grow in the shade, the leaves, uh, the area increases so that they can collect more light. For sunny and hot slopes, try growing the grape pine. This is our uh, pine from the coast ranges. Um, it has a rounded canopy and uh, it's not very dense. So the shaded cast is not very dense. You can grow things under, underneath it. And the cones are large and uh, many species of birds will try to get at the pine nuts. Coast live oak is native to our area. It's um, an evergreen oak, which is found both on the valley floor and the lower foothills. It's, uh, it lives to about 250 years and it's a true habitat plant. I have one in the backyard that is about 20 years old, 25 feet tall. And I observed something very interesting this year, which is that in the middle of summer, Anna's hummingbird went to each leaf on the coast live oak. And it is finding something there. I'm not sure what it is right now. Maybe it's insects or, or some kind of uh, food item, but it was foraging in a very systematic methodic manner as it does when it's next to uh, red flowers, for example. Also, if you have the space, I encourage you to plant the valley oak. This is the signature oak tree of Santa Clara Valley. Uh, the valley was once a large savanna, large grassland studded with widely spaced oaks. Unlike other oaks, this oak thrives with summer water and high water tables. You can water it all you want in the summer. It will grow faster. 
And this oak uh, is dated to live 600 years. So, so it's a real, um, when you plant a valley oak, you're planting an ecosystem that is going to outlast many, many generations. If you don't have the space and you're looking for small tree suggestions, I have three suggestions for you. The first one is my absolute favorite. This is the California Buckeye. And why I love it is because it has seasonal interest. It looks different in every season. The picture here shows it in the springtime, late spring, when it is covered with these candles of white blossoms that are very fragrant and provide pollen and nectar to a variety of pollinators, native pollinators. In the summertime, this tree, the leaves will turn dry and brown and they will persist on the tree through the summer. And if you look at our forested hillsides, particularly in the Diablo range, in the summer, you will see uh, dark green, you will see gray, but wherever you see red and reddish brown color, that is the California buckeye. And that is, adds summer color to, to our hillsides. In the winter, this is what the tree looks like. It's leafless in the winter, and it has this uh, white silvery bark and a very interesting intricate branching pattern. And it's, it's quite striking even when it is without foliage. Another wonderful small tree is the holly leaf cherry. Here in the picture, you see um, a shot that is uh, taken from below the tree. It's covered with cream colored small white flowers. And the entire tree was just uh, surrounded by, by a halo of insects and buzzing pollinators. Uh, it, it's, it has incredible wildlife value. The flowers will mature into these green cherries, which ripen towards the end of summer into a, a deep purple. And although the flesh is not very thick, uh, it is tasty and it is edible. Blue elderberry is naturally a small multi-trunked tree and its berries are actually uh, a big magnet for songbirds of all kinds. If you want to grow this in a home garden, it does need some pruning and shaping because it suckers very readily from the base because it wants to be multi-trunked. And in a home garden, if, you're, if you don't have the space, you might want to shape it so that it, a few trunks remain, but most of the growth is above uh, human height. This plant is winter deciduous. Moving on now to large shrubs, and this is a very, very abbreviated list, but these are plants that I've grown and I can vouch for them. Big berry manzanita is the largest and most common manzanita of the inner coast range. Um, it has beautiful, smooth mahogany colored bark, and it blooms in the winter with these upside down urn shaped flowers where the opening is at the bottom. And Anna's hummingbird absolutely delights in, in hanging out and uh, getting nectar from these flowers. Coyote bush is extremely common in our area. Uh, it's a pioneer plant, it's evergreen, and wherever there is land disturbance, there's a landslide, there's road cuts, wherever, one of the first native plants to grow in that spot will be coyote bush. It is evergreen, it is drought tolerant, it's fast growing, and it actually creates habitat for other native plants to, to grow. So it, it is the pioneer plant in a succession of plants that will uh, colonize that space. Uh, it comes in male and female forms. The picture here shows a female plant uh, full of seed that is about to ripen and blow away in the wind. Uh, wonderful plant. You can prune it very easily too. 
for the shadier part of the garden, consider growing Oregon grape, which is native to our part of California. It's uh, very handsome and attractive and low maintenance. You, you hardly ever have to prune it or shape it. Um, these bright yellow flowers in spring will turn into purple berries in the fall. They're quite tart, but they're edible. Also for shade, I recommend uh, the California coffee berry. Pictured here is the selection called Eve Case. And the berries are large and they're not ripe yet. They will ripen to a dark chocolate color that the birds and other critters like to consume. Um, this is also one of those shrubs that needs very little maintenance. It looks neat and tidy 12 months of the year. The flowers are very small, but they are full of pollen and nectar, and you will attract a lot of native bees and hummingbirds to coffee berry flowers. Toyon is my candidate for the state shrub of California whenever we get one. Um, it's an evergreen shrub with seasonal interest. If you look at it in late April, early May, it will be covered with small white flowers that are rich with pollen and nectar and attract a lot of pollinators. They will mature to green berries all summer long, which ripen to red in November, December timeframe. And that's when hordes of cedar wax wings and robins and house finches and other songbirds will descend on these shrubs. And um, there's a lot of activity in this bush in the winter time. Wonderful plant. This is a golden current and it is suitable for um, locations that have bright shade. Um, it blooms in February and will it will make a thicket if it likes the spot it will send out runners and new shoots will emerge from there. I've not had it do that in my garden. Uh, mine is a very dry garden, but uh, Lake Cunningham, where we planted it, it has volunteered and sent out runners. It's very happy and created a thicket in which we see a lot of songbirds, including quail foraging in that thicket. It's good habitat. And the small berries are also edible and, and tasty. Its cousin, the chaparral current, is sun loving. And in a garden situation, it stays greener longer with some shade and some summer water. This is one of the most beautiful shrubs of California, the pink flowering current. And it doesn't do well in my garden in full sun, but it thrives in bright shade. Uh, the leaves are fragrant and it, it looks nicer with some summer water and you can prune and shape this any which way you like. I want to share with you some suggestions for vines. And I want to mention that in nature, our native vines are usually found growing on existing shrubs and trees. They like their roots to be cool, but they grow up through the shrubs and trees and reach for light. And that's where they flower and set seed. So the shrubs and trees act as a natural trellis for them. This is Chaparral clematis. It's, uh, it flowers in the springtime and in summer, the, the, the vine will go dormant, the leaves dry up, but the flowers turn into cotton puff seed balls that persist on the vine. And they're quite decorative. If, if you've been on hikes in Alum Rock Park uh, in the summertime, you're going to encounter multiple shrubs, all of them with lots of cotton balls on them. And that's this particular vine. So um, if you have a toyon or um, coast live oak, this is something you could train on it. And the two plants will coexist. One will not smother the other. The pink honeysuckle does well in part shade, 
I found that this uh, vine has a lanky habit and therefore it's, it's not uh, a vine that holds its own by itself on a bare trellis as I've shown in the photo, but it would do wonderful on a shrub. So the picture shown um, is from a few years ago. This vine didn't survive that particular location. I want to draw your attention to the hummingbird in the photo that never misses out on any nectar opportunity. California has several native grapes. The one in the picture is actually a hybrid uh, between a native grape and a European grape. And the hybrid is called Rogers Red because the leaves turn reddish in, in the fall. There's a native variety called Walker Ridge, which grows much more slowly, is much uh, lower maintenance than Rogers Red. And its leaves turn bright yellow in the fall. So in my garden, uh, the Rogers Red is slowly dying. It's about 20 years old, but in its place is coming up Walker Ridge and it's uh, really truly low maintenance. There are many native morning glories in California and I've seen hummingbirds uh, come to their flowers. It's a good vine to place in an open location such as a fence where they have space to grow and where they can be pruned easily if you need to. Some suggestions for small shrubs. So most of us have, have constraints on how much space we have in, in the garden and how many trees and large shrubs we can plant. But we can always make space for small shrubs. And I'm going to uh, give you a short list of, of my favorites. The first one is California sagebrush. And it's, it's a strong point really appearance wise is that in the winter and spring, it is covered with new foliage that is silvery gray and it, it just looks beautiful at that time of year. Uh, it supports many kinds of organisms and you may observe uh, spittlebugs, different kinds of galls. You might even encounter tohi nests inside one of these. So it, it's an all around good plant for habitat. In nature, you're gonna see this occurring on slopes. Um, wherever you see grassy slopes, where the slope becomes steep enough, the grassland gives way to a uh, coastal scrub. And this is the dominant plant in that coastal scrub community because it has deep roots and it binds the soil really well. Wherever you see this growing, you're unlikely to see landslide. So if you have a slope, slopey backyard or something, this is a great plant to put there. Another wonderful plant, California buckwheat, is uh, locally native to our area. It's uh, great quality is that it starts blooming when most of the spring blooms are finished. It starts blooming in late June, July. And it has these beautiful white pom-pom flowers that are full of pollen and nectar. And you will encounter insects and butterflies you've never seen before if you plant this plant. Uh, when the flowers turn, turn to seed, the, the inflorescence turns bright red or copper. And it's attractive in its, in its own right. It's very easy to propagate. So if you have one plant, you can very easily make more and more plants out of them from cuttings. Sticky monkey flower is native to our, our hills. And uh, in the garden, I find that it prefers some shade and some summer moisture. Also like the California buckwheat, you can easily propagate this plant from cuttings. Black sage is the only locally native shrubby sage. All the other shrubby sages come from Southern California, or Central California. Uh, why I love this sage is because of its aroma. It's strongly aromatic. It flowers profusely in the springtime and will attract all manner of bees and hummingbirds. Uh, 
in nature, it goes a bit crispy in the summertime. But if you give it a little bit of summer water, you can keep it looking nice and green. Blue witch likes to grow in the shade of adjacent shrubs. You rarely find this growing in full sun. Um, and in the summertime, in response to summer drought in my garden, it will actually drop all its leaves, but the stems remain green and the leaves will come out again with the winter rains. I have a few suggestions for grasses. Um, keep in mind that all our native bunch grasses are actually perennials with deep root systems. They bind the soil, they capture carbon in their tissue underground, and they provide food and uh, habitat for local wildlife. Um, the first one is a shade-loving grass called Tories Melek. And I planted this in the backyard and it has volunteered happily and readily in all the shady parts of the garden. It's about a foot tall and it looks attractive 12 months of the year. Usually in grasses for maintenance, I will cut them to the ground in December to rejuvenate them and have new growth uh, the following season. Its cousin is the California Melic, which is about two feet tall, maybe two and a half feet tall. And it has larger seed heads, which turn this golden uh, color in the summertime. And, and uh, it looks very attractive to me. One of the reasons I, I like grass in the garden is because the flowering stalks just move in the air with the slightest breeze. So it's like the grass is waving or dancing in your garden. It adds this, this dynamism to, to your landscape. Um, so California Melic is, is a wonderful plant for the garden. This is our state grass, purple needle grass. And it grows to about two and a half feet tall. It volunteers readily in my garden. And when it's uh, in peak bloom, the, the flowers or, or seed heads have this distinct purple tinge to them that, that's uh, noticeable, um, hence the name purple needle grass. It has a younger, smaller cousin called nodding needle grass, Stipacerna. And this is shorter, about a foot or 18 inches tall. And it is more dainty, more delicate, and it fits smaller beds better. So keep, keep that in mind if you're looking for grasses. Pine bluegrass is a compact bunch grass. It doesn't take much space horizontally and even vertically. It's about a foot, 18 inches tall. Uh, its seed heads, its it, inflorescence has seasonal interest. It changes from purple to green to tan, and it just looks very neat and tidy the year round. In the in late fall, in December, I will um, cut it, cut this down to the ground, and it comes back new. Very, very long list of perennials. I will uh, go over them fairly quickly, but um, if something strikes your fancy, please make a note. I talked about yarrow before. It's uh, native to California. And naturally in nature, you will find that this goes brown and dormant in the summertime. In the garden, if you give it summer water, it will stay greener longer. Um, you can also cut it to the ground in the winter each year to renew it. Narrow leaf milkweed is our local uh, milkweed. It's sun loving and it appreciates occasional summer moisture and it stays green all summer long with very little water. It attracts all kinds of insects. You will actually see aphids on this plant, but do not be concerned. Those aphids will not kill the plant and they will not go anywhere else. They like the milkweed so much. And once you have aphids, you're gonna get ladybugs and other beetles that like to feed on the aphids. So um, I, I used to worry about the aphids and I, I stopped worrying about them because the plant is happy 
and and the critters are happy. So who am I to complain? Um, this is also the host plant for many butterflies that will lay their eggs on this plant, including the monarch. So their caterpillars need milkweed leaves to, to grow and thrive. A sun-loving perennial for the garden is the sacred dhatura. And this plant is not grown often enough and doesn't get enough respect. Um, many people know that this plant is highly toxic and so on and so forth. But um, as long as you don't ingest it, it's no danger to, to you or anybody else. I've grown it in my garden. I've grown it at the park. And um, it turns out to be short-lived in my garden. It lives about three to four years, but it sets a lot of seed. So I never have to buy this plant. There's always something volunteering in my garden. Uh, all the time. The flowers are very large, trumpet-shaped, and the stamens resemble harp strings. And native bees are going to climb into that corolla tube, and they're going to play those harp strings like harp strings. And what happens is it shakes the pollen loose from the anthers and falls down below on the bees themselves. And that's how they go about collecting their precious pollen. Uh, it's really fun to watch. California fuchsia or zauschneria is a, a wonderful plant for the home garden. Uh, it's summer flowering. It loves sun, but will grow in part shade as well. It's perfect for hummingbirds. The, the length of the flower tube is approximately equal to the length of the hummingbird's beak. And it's the, the nectar is at the base of each flower tube and, and they just adore this plant. Um, in a home garden, I prune this to the ground in the winter every year. So I hope you're noticing that there's a theme here with regard to perennials. Many of them require once a year maintenance in the winter, just cut them to the ground and they come back the following season. Coyote mint is actually a shrub. It's woody at the base, but I included it in this section because it is so small. It's uh, about 12 inches, one foot tall. Um, it has very fragrant leaves um, and you can make tea out of the leaves, just like the native Californians did. The flowers come out in late April, May time frame, and they attract many pollinators. The variety that I show here is uh, called Russian River, which is tolerant of summer watering. Lysingia is a summer blooming, sun loving perennial that does best in my garden with some summer water. And you can see a bee actually in one of the blooms near the center of the photo there. And talking of grasslands, uh, checker bloom is native to our grasslands in the Bay Area. And it's a very fine, delicate uh, perennial where the leaves hug the ground, but the flower stalks will try to come up above the foliage and uh, they're very attractive. What I found in my garden was that this plant needed some summer water. It, it's not happy going completely dry. California aster is somewhat larger. It gets to about two and a half, three feet tall when it's happy. And it makes a big ball. Um, this picture is taken in October of 2005, growing by Guadalupe River. Um, it flowers in the summer and it and attracts many, many, many pollinators. Um, for maintenance in a home garden, again, you would cut this to the ground in the winter and it will come back fresh next season. For the shadier part of the garden, consider hummingbird sage. It has uh, a wonderful aroma both to the leaves and um, the flowers attract hummingbirds, so it's well-named. 
And in nature, it will go a bit crispy and dormant in the summertime. But you can rejuvenate it by pruning it to the ground, except that last node. Keep that last node and the new growth will come out uh, from that last node. For the shade loving, uh, shady, shady parts of the garden, uh, woodland strawberry is a great, uh, utterly low growing, about a few inches, if that, um, ground cover. It expands quite happily and readily. Uh, it sets out tiny strawberries, which will be eaten by your neighborhood birds um, if you don't get to it first. Um, so it, it's a nice ground cover if you have shady patches. Also for shade, Douglas iris does very well. Uh, it is deep rooted and uh, stays evergreen the, the year round. It will flower in the spring and usually flowering is enhanced with some light. So if it gets morning sun or bright shade, it's going to flower more for you. Uh, Ken Himes and D. Himes told us also that about once every five years, if you divide, uh, if you dig it up and divide the corms, the, the rhizomes, it uh, also enhances their flowering. Also for the shade and uh, moist parts of your garden, consider the Western Bleeding Heart. It is beautiful fern-like leaves that, that look nice even without flowers. And when it blooms, the, the hanging bleeding heart-shaped flowers uh, look very decorative. In the summertime, this plant will disappear in my garden. There are no dry stalks to clean up, nothing. It just withers away, goes away. So it's really low maintenance and it comes back with the winter rains. The Western Columbine is shade and moisture loving. The foliage is only about one foot tall, but the flowering stalks come up two or three feet above with these hanging pendulous bright red flowers. And um, it's a favorite of the hummingbirds. Um, you see the vertical spikes in the photo. Uh, that's, those are the sepals and the nectar is at the base of the sepals. In order to get the nectar, the hummingbird has to fly up from below, stick its beak up the sepal to get the nectar. And meanwhile, all the anthers are rubbing against her chest. And that's how the pollen transfer happens and cross-pollination happens. Uh, this plant will volunteer readily. It sets seed and will come back if it likes the, the habitat. I want to give you some ideas for uh, bulbs. Um, I like bulbs in the garden because I'm a lazy gardener and bulbs are the ultimate in lazy gardening. You plant them once and then you enjoy them forever. Um, bulbs also add seasonal interest. When they come up, you know it is winter or spring and when they disappear and go away, you know it is summer and fall. And um, at most, you might have to remove their dry stalks in early summer. But otherwise, there is zero maintenance involved here. Meadow onion is sun loving. It does very well in my garden. It's been there for at least 15 years. And the only maintenance I have to do is collect the dry stalks in early summer to just tidy up the beds. That's it. It produces a lot of seeds and uh, my garden is rife with songbirds, ground feeders that find all kinds of food on, on paths and in beds uh, left behind by bulbs like this. Blue dips used to be called blue dicks, but now blue dips is sun loving. And if it's happy with the situation, will colonize and expand. Uh, it, it's a nice uh, marker of spring in the garden. Wild hyacinth also grows very easily uh, in the garden and it's sun loving. Pretty face, uh, another wonderful bulb to grow in the garden, grows very easily. 
And finally, ethereal spear. Um, this plant will lay dormant in the ground until the rains come. And then you will see in de January, December, January, the leaves coming out. And then it just lots of foliage covering the ground, but no sign of flowers. And you wait and you wait and you wait. And round about May, the foliage starts drying out. And that's when the flower stalks will start poking up through the ground. And this is what it looks like in May. It's really low maintenance, it's bulletproof, can't kill it. Um, one thing I should mention about all, most of our California bulbs are really uh, dry summer bulbs. So you don't want to put them in a bed that gets summer water on a regular basis. The bulbs will rot and, and die. Um, there are some bulbs that come from Northern California that can tolerate moist meadows, summer meadows, but the ones I've talked about are all summer dry bulbs. Let me talk to you about some of my favorite wildflowers. These are annuals. Um, Ruby chalice clarkia is among the last to bloom in my garden. It's common on our hillsides, uh, very, very attractive. Its cousin is the elegant clarkia. It has a different habit. Ruby chalice is more mounding, and this one is more vertical and tall, and therefore it's suitable for narrow beds. And this will grow in full sun as well as part shade. So it's quite amenable. And if happy, it will volunteer from last year's seed stock. For the shady part of your garden, consider Chinese houses. Um, it will reseed happily if it lives that long. In my garden, uh, there's a snail and slug problem, and I have a hard time keeping it alive, uh, keeping it safe from the snails and slugs. So if you go with this, make sure that you protect it against these mollusks. The state flower, the California poppy, um, I feel like uh, smiling every time I see it. It lifts my spirits. Um, and I don't see enough of it in our gardens. Uh, it's so easy to grow. And there's a technique for managing it, which is that when it is done flowering and has gone to seed, the stalks and the leaves turn a pasty white. And many people think that looks unattractive and therefore it's not a good plant to plant. But what they don't know is that if you prune off the pasty white stalks at the right time before the tap root has dried out. If you cut off the top part before the tap root has dried out with just a little bit of water for the rest of the year from the tap root is gonna grow new foliage, is gonna bloom again and the cycle will repeat and you can keep it going for years and years and years. So that's the trick to um, having poppies in your garden 12 months of the year. A good companion for the poppy is globe gilia uh, for color contrast and also for ease of growth and, and vigorous reseeding. Uh, they, they look good together. And once you have them in a bed, you'll always have them. If you have a sunny but moist part of the garden, consider growing meadow foam. Uh, there are many varieties available. This particular one is called sulfur meadow foam. Is native to the to San Mateo County. The blazing star is one of the most beautiful of local wildflowers. It is also our chapter logo and symbol and the name of our chapter newsletter. Uh, it's easy to grow and uh, more people ought to grow it. If you have a moist spot, like a leaky faucet, you wanna put seed monkey flower there. It loves sun and it loves moisture and it reseeds freely in those conditions. The wind poppy likes shady spots and it's one of the more diminutive of wildflowers. It's barely six inches tall, maybe eight inches or so. And it's, Flowers, when they open, they are always facing away from the sun. Um, very nice, colorful plant. 
Finally, I want to recommend a few books to you. If you can afford one and only one book, let it be the first one, Native Plants for the Garden by Bornstein, Frost, and O'Brien. These three authors between them have over 100 years of experience growing California native plants. And the book is organized like a reference. It's alphabetic and you can, you know, go to any plant you're looking up. There are very detailed write-ups and nice pictures with, with each. Um, the second book is, is uh, dear to, to our chapter. Uh, Helen Popper is a chapter member and she's also an economics professor who attended uh, the chapters Gardening with Natives meetings 20 years ago and took copious notes at those meetings. And uh, out of those notes, she wrote this amazing book that is organized um, by calendar month. You can open it up to September and you will get many ideas for what you could be doing in your garden in September, whether it's planting, whether it is pruning, uh, various maintenance tasks. Um, all of that is nicely organized and her writing style is really evocative and, and lyrical. Uh, I highly recommend this. Um, I think that that's all I want to do at this point. I will stop here and take questions. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, Arvind. If people, we have a few questions in the chat, please um, put in more. Um, someone was asking about whether elderberries are poisonous to animals. And as I said, I know birds eat them very readily. I have a steady stream of birds visiting my elderberry. I have made jam and syrup with them. The, it is recommended that you cook them before eating them. I don't know anything about other animals. And um, I, I can speak a little bit to that. So there are two kinds of elderberry in our area. The more common one is the blue elderberry that I talked about. All parts of the plant are not edible by humans. So any green tissue, including stems, branches, leaves, are not to be eaten, or even the unripe berries. But once the berries ripen to blue, light blue, the berries themselves are edible. Uh, people eat them, they make pies out of them, they make wine out of them, and so on and so forth. The second kind of elderberry in our area is in the Santa Cruz Mountains. It's called red elderberry, and that is toxic to, to humans. So you never want to eat the red elderberry, but you're not going to see it that commonly unless you live in the Santa Cruz Mountains or some uh, shady, moist mountain habitat. Okay, and there was another question about um, whether um, checker bloom was looked like a, was it was a mallow. And uh, I actually didn't look it up, but I pretty much remember it is in the mal mallow family. Am I right? I believe I believe it is in the mallow family. It might even be called checker mallow, but I, I go with checker bloom. Sedalsia okay. malviflora. It's Flowers a... like mallow, right? Malvo, malviflora. And I also want to point out that um, that these are local natives, but you know people have different habitats. And I know tons of people in Santa Clara Valley, not just Arvind, have globe gilia reseed like crazy. It will not reseed in my garden. But I have bird's eye gilia. So there's a lot of beautiful gilias. And so with annuals, you want to try them and see which ones are happy. And Vivian pointed out that uh, we have native plants for the garden in our nursery store. So if you're buying plants, you can add that book to your order and uh, pick it up, um, either if there's a pop-up sale or at our sale in October. And let's see. Do we have other questions? Barbara, am I missing any? Um, oh, yes, yes, yes. Somebody wanted to know if the PowerPoint slides will be available. So I wanted to know what you thought about that, Arvind. I'm happy to make them available. Um, and and I, I want to add that if uh, 
if some of the material we covered was, was uh, known to you, I encourage you to use these slides and give talks of your own to your neighbors, your friends, uh, whatever, spread the word. Uh, the more, more of us engage in this, uh, the better off we all are. Okay. So, um, oh, we have a couple, some questions coming in. Um, what are the best places to get um, native plants in the Bay Area? And um, so, of course, we have our uh, native plant nursery. Um, Calscape lets you, if you go on Calscape, um, you look up a plant, it will tell you what nurseries are known to carry it. You have to check with the nursery. I have experience with buying, uh, you know, in terms of commercial nurseries, well, in terms of um, nonprofits, besides our nursery, Grassroots Ecology also has plants and they tend to carry plants that we don't and vice versa. And, um, and, um, commercial nurseries. Pay, um, is it the Payless in Palo Alto? Yeah, and I, um, I just put a link in the chat for a resource on our website that has a list of a lot of local native plant nurseries. Right. I'll, I'll mention a few of, of the ones that I frequent uh, these days. Uh, in the South Bay, there is Almaden Valley Nursery. They have a native plant section where you can find natives. Uh, Remember that to to find native plants, you don't want to go to big box stores, okay? Always go to small independent nurseries. And if they don't have the plant you're looking for, first, first of all, have the scientific name of the plant with you. And if they don't have it in stock, ask them, can you order it from Sunset? Suncrest. Sorry, Suncrest, thank you. So they will be happy to special order it for you. It may take a week or so um, when the next truck arrives, but that, that's a way to support small, smaller nurseries and get the plants you need without driving a long distance. Um, lately, I've been also driving long distances <laughs> to, to go north to uh, Watershed Nursery in Richmond. Um, it's a long drive. But uh, they have some a nice selection of, of locally native plants. And uh, sometimes also stop by at Annie's Annuals. Um, they have a native section. As you enter immediately on your left, there's a row of native uh, plants. And uh, the prices are not as... as uh, affordable as they used to be, but it's still fun fun browsing there, so. Actually, Arvind, can I just add another one to your little loop there? Please, please, do that loop? please. Um, there's also Oaktown Nursery in Berkeley and across the street from it is Vix and Absolute I So I always stop it at Oaktown and then get lunch at Vix and then continue on to Watershed. So that's my, and, and Annie. <laughs> Yes, yes. So Vivian, there's a question about the um, our nursery. Are the local are there local natives of local genetic stock? And it's a myth. So in some cases, yes, in some cases, no, we don't have uh, the all of that information. If you really want to be sure that you, you're getting local stock, I highly recommend going to getting uh, plants from grassroots ecology. They will also be there on October 8th for our and you can also just order from them and drive up the hill, they're located in Foothill Park, but they will be there on October 8th when we have our fall sale and you, right. you'll be able to order their plants. And they, because they're a restoration nursery, so that is one of the things about watershed nursery and grassroots ecology is they're both restoration nurseries. So if you're, if you wanna really be sure about the source of your plants, it's best if you search out restoration nursery. So Oaktown, for example, it also does some restoration. Um, but those nurseries always, I mean, that's actually part of what you have to do as a restoration nursery is keep track of those things. I see in the chat that Barbara mentioned Yabo Buena Nursery in Half Moon Bay. Thank you for mentioning that. It's one of the oldest nurseries in the area. It uh, used to be in the hills, but it has relocated to Half Moon Bay and they have a good selection. Okay, uh, another question. What natives would do well with a gray water system? I don't know that much about it. Anyone else? 
I'm afraid I have to beg ignorance. I don't have a gray water system. Although what I do know is that typically people often water shrubs and trees with gray water. So I'll just make a comment about gray water systems and plants is um, a lot of the coastal plants will do fine because gray water, you know, the thing about gray water is high in salt. So some of those coastal plants that are adapted for dealing with salty areas are more amenable to gray water. Um, but actually, that's a good question. We should probably build up a list of gray water friendly plants. So possibly checker bloom because um, that's a coastal that's a coastal plant. So if I put in a gray water system, maybe I can get get the checker bloom to survive in my yard. Like a big shrub would be atriplex that saltbush. Right. Or probably would love gray water. Pacific wax myrtle which also grows right on the coastal bluffs. And there is a question about some grasses are cool season and some are warm season. And what that means is some grasses put on most of their growth in cool season, some wait for warmer weather and you cut them back at different times. Um, maybe we, I- uh, All the grasses I talked about are cool season. so. Uh, you can cut them back in the winter. I think uh, for contrast, um, deer grass in the picture behind me is not locally native. That's why I didn't include it. Include it. It's a warm season grass. So it actually blooms uh, and grows most in the summertime. Yeah, I have, I have a list. I researched this and I should actually, if, I could actually try and look it up in a talk I gave on maintenance because you cut them back at different times relating to it. A number of Southern California grasses are warm season growers like um, purple three on and I think alkali sacaton, but I'm pretty sure, I think most of our local natives um, are cool season except possibly, um, does, isn't Buda Loa grassless also native, locally native? It has a very wide area and it's a warm season grower. And that's about the only locally native one I can think of that's a warm season grower. The, it's called buffalo grass, blue grama, it has tons and tons of common names. And it's native over a very wide area of the West um, and can grow where it's very cold. So it's getting to be time to cut I mean, soon it will be time to cut back um, a number of the uh, cool season growers if you want to cut them back before they start their new growth. I have a, a meadow and we've started cutting back some of, some of the grasses. Oh, anybody have a definition for bright shade? Well, I'll give you mine. So uh, my house, the front yard faces sort of southeast, mostly south, a little bit east. So my backyard, so I have a two-story house. So my backyard, half of it is in shade for the better part of the day. But there's the shade is coming from the, the wall on the house, right? The outer wall. There's no trees that are making that shade. So if you sit in the backyard, you look up, you're looking up at the sky, there's a lot of light, even though I'm in shade. So I call that bright shade. But if I go below, say I have a fig tree in the backyard, in the shade of the fig tree in summer is really deep shade because the fig tree's leaves are very large, it's very dense and very little light gets to, to the bottom of it. So my, dug irises that are in the deep shade of the fig tree, they are happy, but they don't flower so much. The ones on the edge where they are getting more light, even though they're in shade, they're in bright shade, they flower more. Okay, there's another question here about indicating each plant, whether it's full sun, bright shade or shade. And I'm going to I'm going to make a point about this because Arvin mentioned Calscape, which is this really great database for gardeners. And if you use Calscape, and I frequently use this, um, 
it will tell you what its sun requirements are. It will show the ultimate size. It even has a silhouette of how it tends to grow, how much water it wants. It's a really, really, really useful resource. So instead of us making lists these days, more and more people are actually using Calscape as a resource. And the state has put um, a number of resources into making Calscape better and better and more and more robust. So I highly urge any gardener to start using Calscape as a resource. It's not an app that you get on your phone. It's something, it's um, web-based database. So on, you know, any way that you connect to inter internet, you type in Calscape and you get into it. And I know, um, um, Vivian gave several talks about using Calscape if you really want to get into all the bells and whistles, which you don't have to. You can just use it just to say, okay, let me look up again. What kind of requirements does Checker Bloom have? And um, so Calscape is a native plant gardener's friend. Bookmark it on your computer. And end of ad, but I, I absolutely adore Calscape and it's really, really, really useful. And it's helping me put plants in the right place. Let's see. I'm in. Okay. Um, Susan says laundry to landscape is better for fruit trees for the nutrients it provides. Um, Brett Tucker, what plants are rabbit proof? In, in my experience, no young plant is rabbit proof. Every young plant I put out in my yard has a little chicken wire fence around it. I have learned this the hard way because even if they're supposedly rabbit proof, like um, white sage, it's the most aromatic plant. It's supposed to be impervious to animals eating it. But you know, some young, young animals are dumb. So we planted this nice little new white sage plant. I went out there and someone had nipped it off and then left it there saying, ooh, that tastes bad. So, and it was a new plant. So of course they killed it. So I got another one. I put a fence around it. Once it's big enough, nothing bothers it. But if you want to keep, you know, rabbits will eat anything that's young and green. Once they get to be about 12, 18 inches, they're usually tough enough that they don't kill them. I don't know. We have, we have jackrabbits at Lake Cunningham. And I can't tell you how many young plants we've lost to. You know, we see them neatly cut at the base as if, you know, you took a pruning shears to it or something like that. Um, so, yeah. I, I don't know that there is such a thing as a rabbit proof plant. But, you know, in my yard, I have this collection of like ugly chicken wire little fences that I put around new plants. And every now and then I take them off too soon. Well, also there's a suggestion that Valley Water would probably know what plants work with gray water because they have that laundry to landscape rebate program, but I don't know that they have a lot of native plants in the list, but they might have some. Okay. Um, question to Arvind or anyone, do you have a favorite book that covers propagating California native plants? You know, I'm, I'm a casual propagator. I propagate uh, some plants in the garden, but I'm not, I'm not uh, a horticulturist or, or a nursery professional. There's a book put out by the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden called um, Propagating California Plants by Dara Emery. I it's a very, oh, very slim, slim book, and it's mainly a very large table of hundreds of plants, native plants, and the best way to grow them. So it's considered to be a reference um, if, if you're so inclined. Um, 
one good source of information is on Facebook, there is a uh, group for California native plant propagation. And there are many knowledgeable people on that list who are running nurseries or doing restoration work and they're exchanging notes. They're, they're you know, doing peer-to-peer -peer conversations and you can learn a lot by just lurking and listening. Okay, um, Carrie Olson also said that there's propagation info in Helen Popper's book and Nevin Smith's Native Treasures, um, which is another book that I, act I actually really like for the plants it covers, it's, it's very useful info. So another question, Arvind, how has your plant maintenance changed with the latest drought situation? Well, to be completely honest, I have lost um, several large shrubs in my garden in the last two years. And um, I have not been able to determine the root cause, but I've lost a toyon, I've lost two coffee berries, and most recently I lost my beloved big berry manzanita, the photo that I showed. Uh, it, it passed after 20 years. So I really can't say um, whether the drought was to blame or whether it was my intervention. I don't know yet. I had an arborist come and inspect my toyon and they couldn't find anything wrong with, with, with the plant. They thought that it might sucker from the base and come back, but it, it didn't. So um, in terms of maintenance in the garden, I think um, I'm more cautious now about young plants in the garden uh, than I was, say, 10, 15 years ago. We actually had moist years 10, 15 years ago. We had years of normal rainfall. We're not having that now. So if I put young plants that are one, two, three years old in the garden, I'm going out in the summer, making sure they're alive and throwing some water on them. Uh, so that adds to the maintenance task. Um, other than that, I would say that the more mature your plants, your shrubs get, the shrubs and the perennials, there's less work to do. Um, also that my garden had many more annuals when it was young. And now that it is more mature, it has many more perennials and shrubs and fewer annuals. The space for annuals has been uh, restricted to, to a smaller area. So I'm sort of uh, enjoying the, the extra time that it gives me from, from maintenance, but I'm a tinkerer. I always want to try out new things. So uh, life, life goes on, um, but it's, it's, it's nice in the summer. There's very little work to do in the garden in the summertime. You just sit on the swing and read a book. Well, um, I'll second what Arvind said is I lost a number of plants in the last two years. Although to be fair, I kind of really neglected my garden during lockdown. I, I don't know, I just couldn't get interested in plant in garden maintenance. It got pretty shabby and I lost some plants, but I think part of it was, you know, planting them as Arvind said in wetter years and the amount of watering has gone down. So I have planted plants that should like it drier, but I am going around doing hand watering to supplement, to get them through. You know, even though I planted them in the winter, I watered them in the winter because we did not get enough rain. And I am doing hand watering in the summer. You know, I've been hand watering and I hope things will be okay because it's been too hot to water anything in this in this heat wave. So yeah, you have to keep your fingers crossed. And, and now I really do think about planting a plant is, do I have the main, you know, do I have the time to maintain this until it gets established? Which is what Arvind's saying, yeah. So this winter will kind of be a test, you know, this hopefully a, a 
how I how my maintenance how my watering schedule has done you know you walk the tightrope of not overwatering and not underwatering with new plants and when plants are young they can tolerate more water than when they're mature Actually, there's a lot of good information in the chat that we haven't covered. I encourage everyone to save the chat um, and you can browse it later. Um, there's three dots in the chat window at the bottom. And I think if you click on it, there's the first option is to save chat. Yeah, and if you do that, when you um, leave the meeting, um, a little box pops up with your saved chat. And I, um, oh, another question from YouTube. Should we be planting plants from the further south now? This is a big, this is a big question that I think is a little too big for us to answer now in terms, I know, okay. In my yard, because I am not adjacent to wildlands, I have planted Southern California natives in particularly difficult sections where it's very hot. Right along the road by my driveway where there's tons of reflected heat, I have a, a globe mallow, um, a Sparrowsia fendleri that's thriving and reseeding. And many local natives there, because of the artificial environment, it is too hot for them. I, my, the white sage, which is a Southern California plant, is very happy at the front of my house where many plants have died because my house faces west. And when you have sun hitting a west wall, you get a ton of reflected heat. But um, I know, I think there's been articles in the, the CMPS magazines about this. If you live on the edge of wildlands, you really need to think carefully and use local natives so you're not diluting, you know, you're not introducing genes into the wildlands. That's, that's a very, very important point. Uh, I want to mention that I don't want to give people the impression that I only grow local natives. So if you see my garden, I have plants from other parts of the state as well. I'm a tinkerer. Um, and like Madeline said, there are plants from Southern California that are, do really well in certain parts of home garden environments, which um, are, you know, man-made environments. Our gardens are not the natural areas um, around us. So um, I think it's it's fine to plant plants from other parts of the state, as long as you make sure what Madeline mentioned, which is that if you're next to a wildland infer interface, wild area urban interface, then you don't want to in introduce plants in your garden that might hybridize and contaminate the local native gene pool. So that's a concern if, if you live close, if you have a big ranch, you're close to a county park, for example. For most of us who live in uh, urban areas, uh, you can plant whatever you want. Um, the, the, the topic for today's talk is really to encourage uh, all of us to give the local natives a chance to introduce you to what local natives exist that make for good garden plants. And if you have the right corner, the right spot in your garden, they will do just as well as any other plant. The bigger philosophical question of global warming and and you know should we be planting Southern California natives on a mass scale? Um, that that's a big big discussion. I don't want to go there, but uh, I have very I know <laughs> what my answer for that is. I think we should be trying to reverse you know global warming. You know, produce less CO two, uh, conserve the ecosystems, not just give up and say can be done and we might as well, you know, treat it as, as you know, 
it can be stopped. It can be stopped. And there are lots of people who pointed out how to stop it. It just needs to, to, to do it. Okay, Arvind, are you using Western vervain anywhere? I'm so glad you asked. It's one of my favorite local perennials. It's growing in Lake Cunningham Park and it's um, it goes winter dormant, comes up in the uh, spring and summer and it's loved by butterflies. A lot of skippers and other butterflies come to the flowers. In the summertime, it sort of dries up and goes dormant, but it's not dead and it comes back in the winter with the rains. What scientific name are we dealing with here? Verbena laciostachys. Oh, that, okay. It's, it's sort of flat, low growing, except for the flower stalks that come up maybe six inches or so. And it will volunteer. If it's happy with the situation, it will volunteer. I think I put the name in the chat. That's right. Laceo. Um, close enough. Oh, L -A, L -A -S -I -O. yeah. Oh, okay. It doesn't have an H in it. Okay, sorry. But probably close enough for um, a search engine to find it. Yep, yep, yep. Or Calscape. Calscape is is it's got a decent search engine. You don't have to type in the name completely correctly. <laughs> Cuz I'm a bad typist and I know. Okay. I think we So Arvind, I have a question for you about your slides. Um if you send them to me, actually it's not a question. It's just a comment and it's also I think for the group. If you send them to me, I can link them on our native plant page along where this lecture is listed, so just so everyone was aware of where they'll be. So, sure, sure. Okay. okay. So, our native plant lecture series page on our website uh, where Arvind's talk is listed, that's where the slides will be linked. Thank you. I didn't print. I didn't type in the whole URL, but if you go into go to our website, there's a there's a menu across the top, and you can go you can click on that um, the native plant lecture series button. Okay, I have a a couple. I, I forgot an announcement actually. So uh, CNPS is having a conference at the toward the end of October. And our chapter is giving out scholarships um, for students in our chapter area, either students who live in our chapter area or are going to school in our chapter area. So if you are a student, or if you happen to know a student, um, we are still accepting applications for those scholarships and we have a number of them. So um, if you know several students, <laughs> tell them about it. And you can find out about it at our, on our chapter website, which uh, Madeline just put cnps-scv.org. It's right there at the very top of the page. And we would love to get more applications from students because we want to help more students attend the conference. It's going to be a great conference. So for the rest of you who are not students, I'd still urge you to go and check out the conference because, uh, oh, and thank you, Carrie. For, Carrie just put in the conference website. So that I think that's gonna be a, a really interesting conference. A lot of great talks, both horticulture and plant science, restoration, um, it, it, everything. <laughs> and so think about attending. Uh, you, there's also field trips and workshops before the conference. So if you don't have time to go to the whole conference and there's something you wanna look at, you know, learn about, I would also still suggest looking at that website because there are a number of really interesting workshops going on before the conference itself. And, and you don't have to register for the whole thing. You can also get tickets for individual days. Um, and as Vivian said, there's different sort of tracks. I'm not a plant scientist and I'm going to attend a number of the horticulture and also some of the um, conservation talks. That's my plan. 
So we're right at nine o'clock, which I think is drawing us to a close. I didn't want to pitch our gall talk because it's it's just freshly scheduled. So two weeks from today, same place, same channel, um, we'll have, be having a, a talk on galls by Michael Hawk and Mara Fonchak. And this is gall week. So get out, find some galls and put them on uh, iNaturalist because it's, it's, it's really a fun thing. And it does actually help with plant ID once you get to know them. So uh, Arvind, Madeline, any other closing comments? Thoughts? I just want to thank uh, Vivian and Madeline for setting this up and for everyone who's attending on a weeknight to make time. Thank you. And, um, you know, if you've, if you've come away with a few ideas for things to do in your garden out of this talk, uh, I will consider this talk to be very successful. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Arvind. Oh, and thank you, Barbara Hunt, for uh, taking all the information from YouTube and making sure it was flowing. Um, thank you, Barbara. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good night, everybody. I'm going to be ending the session now. <laughs>